please welcome panel moderator, Lily Hay Newman. Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Lily Hay Newman. I'm a reporter with Wired. Uh, and I'm really excited to be here today and be on stage with three really stellar contributors to incident response and threat intelligence. Um, next to me is Leslie Carhart from Dragos. Next to them is Katie Nichols from Red Canary. Uh, and down there is Wendy. Hi, Wendy Whitmore from Palo Alto Networks uh, and Unit 42. Uh, and they're all going to introduce themselves in more detail, but you know, the goal of this session is really to kind of draw back the curtain on incident response and threat intelligence and uh, get an idea of you know, what goes on in their daily lives and hear the stories, some stories from uh, like on the ground, you know, what's really happening, because uh, I think we all talk about this a lot in the abstract, but uh, it's great to you know, hear something more personal and hear their insights. So anyway, it's interesting to you know, see the vantage points that you all have uh, on these like, really broad topics. So I wanted to let all of you uh, talk a little more about where exactly you sit and kind of what's the special thing that you get to see in your daily work. So Leslie, go ahead. Hello, nice to see you all. Wow, this is a great showing for a, a relatively early morning at RSA. My name is Leslie Carhart. I work for a company called Dragos. <coughs> I'm an incident responder there. I've been there for about six years. I've been doing odd incident response in the industrial space for about 15 years. So I work with critical infrastructure systems. So power, water, manufacturing, aviation, trains, all the things that we don't think about as computers traditionally. And that's the space where I respond to crises, Katie. Awesome. I'm Katie Nichols. I'm Director of Intelligence Operations at Red Canary, also a certified instructor for the SANS Institute, so teaching the Cyber Threat Intel course. Um, over my career, that's close to 15 years. I was counting it up, similar to Leslie's. Um, I started out in the Department of Defense, um, working in different security operations centers, threat intel teams embedded there, worked for different contractors. I worked for the MITRE attack team, so thinking about all the different techniques that adversaries are using in intrusions. And now I have visibility into a lot of different environments, seeing lots of different, different types of intrusions and incidents, um, and helping different organizations respond to those. Awesome. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as, as Leslie and Katie mentioned, after Lily, it's just fantastic to be here with you this morning uh, and to see this big crowd. So I'm Wendy. I lead Unit 42. Uh, and Unit 42 is comprised of incident response consulting, proactive services, threat intelligence, and our threat hunters uh, on our managed defense team. So uh, I started my career in the Air Force as a, a special agent investigating computer crimes, have, have worked at a variety of companies in the industry, but always specializing in incident response and threat intelligence. And uh, our teams are really at the intersection, I think, of both the work that Katie and Leslie do in terms of responding to breaches, but also doing the analytics on the background to really determine um, you know, from the strategic lens who's responsible for these, and then what does that mean we need to do next in order to uh, protect against them? So I think we should, we, as we were preparing for this, I was realizing that this, this could be like six hours, you know? Like, we, <laughs> there's so much that we could talk about and that we want to cover, but... It won't be, though. <laughs> yeah, but I was thinking that, uh, you know, maybe we should start by just diving into what it's like when you know, you start, you all start hearing about a new incident that's developing. Uh, and, you know, I thought we could start with talking about 3CX and uh, that sort of supply chain attack situation that had sort of, we've, you know, first it seemed like, okay, this is a supply chain attack. Then it, it came out that really this is two supply chain attacks intersecting uh, and, What's the sort of first day, how, you know, how are you wrapping your minds around this? Where are you hearing things from? Maybe kind of take us through it from your different perspectives that you just kind of laid out. I don't know. Katie, do you want to start? Sure, absolutely. 
Um, it's always interesting because sometimes these incidents start with chatter amongst friends. So that's how you know my colleague first got a tip off for 3CX saying, hey, I heard there's a supply chain thing. Um, and anyone who's tracked big incidents like this, you know that anything you hear in about the first 24 hours, be really skeptical. Mm. Um, so I was very skeptical. I'm like, okay, supply chain, cute. Let's see what's happening. <laughs> Um, and then super grateful to the folks at CrowdStrike who popped up a Reddit post really quickly. Um, thank you to them because the reality is supply chain compromises are so hard to detect. All right, we all have these cognitive biases and I don't know about you, but if I'm looking at a trusted piece of software and I see something spawning from that, I'm like, oh, it's probably fine, which a lot of people did the week before CrowdStrike released that Reddit post. So it's a little chaotic in the beginning. Right, I think you know it's particularly tough in the beginning to be careful about what you know and what you don't know. Right, at this point, we know CrowdStrike reported a supply chain <coughs> compromise with 3CX. If you don't know how bad it is, then from there, it's about kind of scoping it, figuring out do organizations actually use this, right? And it's tougher from a vendor perspective. All of our customers, does anyone use it? If you're a single org, hopefully a little easier. So I'm curious, Wendy, like how your team you know, with your visibility responded to that? Yeah, so I think the first thing I often think is like, uh-oh, okay, there, there goes my weekend, right? <laughs> um, I'm sure like many of you do, uh, you know, most of these events, it seems like are a Friday evening, a Saturday morning, um, at least by the time that our teams get called and start responding at any kind of scale. Um, your point about just not knowing the information and data sets that are valid in that first 24 hours and how dynamic those can become is absolutely critical. Um, you know, at the team I'm at now, it's interesting because not only are we as Unit 42 responding on behalf of clients, but then we're also uh, leading our internal, what we call rapid response uh, across the company. And so we have an obligation to make sure that as soon as we understand what the latest threat intelligence is and what a new attack vector is, that all of our products are detecting this and are uh, able to protect our clients. And so that adds another element, I think, of chaos in a good way, uh, because that's certainly uh, you know, our first and foremost obligation and make sure that we can protect, um, our, that our products are protecting clients throughout the world. But that said, it is very challenging then to manage, okay, how many clients are actually gonna be impacted uh, by this? Is this a thing or is it actually maybe not a thing, right? And it might take us 12 to 24 or even 48 hours or longer to figure that out. And then what type of action plans do we need to put in place on the back end? What's the first day like for you, Leslie? Oh, I work in a slightly different environment where the right. consequences are often much more severe, life, safety, the environment, uh, facilities catching on fire, that's, that's very serious stuff that could happen immediately. And sometimes triage has to happen before we have a full view of everything that's going on. But I loved what Katie said about skepticism. If you are somebody who's thinking about getting into the incident response space, if you're thinking about doing that in the future, you haven't done it yet, something that you will learn that you don't expect is that sometimes you have to be the skeptic. You have to be the one doing the reality check for people who are panicking and think things are much worse than they potentially are. They could really be that bad, but oftentimes you're drawing people back because in those first 24 hours, as both Wendy and Katie said, we just don't know for sure. And typically things tend to be less unusual than they seem to be. Things tend to follow trends. Attackers tend to follow the same TTPs to some degree. It's not always new and novel. And so what we do a lot of the times in those first 24 hours is think about why it might not be as crazy and severe as it really is. Of course, in this case, it was pretty gosh darn severe. That's a great point. I mean, I think with 3CX, I would say it was not on a solar winds level. There were definitely a lot of orgs compromised, but um, based on our visibility, we saw a lot of people got kind of the initial malicious DLLs, but there wasn't really follow-on activity. Right? I think we saw maybe in a handful of environments some stealer activity. And you know, our hypothesis was, because I think it was a Wednesday morning this broke, not a Friday afternoon, thank goodness for <laughs> once. Thanks, CrowdStrike. Um, but you know, I think it's sort of a lesson in collaboration and the power of actually sharing publicly. Because we hypothesized, right, CrowdStrike really early on shared that GitHub was being used for infrastructure. And it's from GitHub, y'all took that infrastructure down quickly 
we hypothesized that that actually might have stopped a lot of environments from having you know, later on intrusion chain phases. Um, so I think a lot of orgs actually got saved by GitHub in that case. Kind of a nice example of a sharing and taking down infrastructure can stop these things from being a lot worse. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'm thinking also about how you all balance, because skepticism is really important in my job too, and so you know that really resonates. But how do you balance that with the need to re react quickly and take things seriously so that that action can happen to prevent, you know, and I'm thinking about log4j as an example of something that, you know, where the, how bad it was going to be or what the impacts were going to be, like the script was kind of not yet written and the question was how quickly could everyone come together and respond and it seemed like because of the sense of urgency and the sort of dire concern that some of the worst, you know, potential outcomes were avoided in that case. Um, so, I don't know, maybe just tell us a little more about, it's hard to verbalize your intuition, but how you, you know, uh, find that balance in the early days. Some intuition is really just a lot of experience and seeing a lot of things. I, I know that's not the answer that everybody wants to hear who's getting into the field. Yes, you have to see a lot of cases to have those good gut feelings as an investigator, but two important skills being an incident responder are being a good investigator. So understanding the scientific method, not jumping to conclusions, needing solid evidence, and then also having very good risk management skills. What is the likelihood of this causing a catastrophic consequence? What if I'm wrong? So you have to actually make those risk decisions while doing really good investigative work, understanding that you can't jump to conclusions, looking for evidence and corroborating evidence. So those are essential skills to being a good incident responder. I would just say plus one on the evidence. And right as an intel analyst, I encourage everyone to think about what assessment do you make, right? What conclusion do you draw based on what evidence? And that's particularly important early on. Um, for example, we assess that this box is infected based on the 3CX supply chain, based on the fact we saw a malicious DLL file reported by CrowdStrike. Like the nuance between, oh my gosh, this is infected, and this is infected based on this evidence, that's so crucial at the beginning when you don't know a lot. How do you know what you know? So I always encourage analysts and incident responders to kind of get in the habit of saying, I think or I assess this based on this, it can really clear up some of that initial confusion. I think to um, double down on what you both said about skepticism, so I wanna say three words, uh, skepticism, curi curiosity, and calm. Uh, the skepticism coming in from, you know, hey, okay, we have an initial data set, but applying that investigative mindset to say, is this really what we think it is? Um, but I'm going to, uh, we want people who not only want to prove an allegation, but disprove it, in the same level of degree, right? That's going to allow us to then really go through those critical decision-making skills um, to determine how, how much of a thing it is. On the curiosity side, um, you know, Leslie's done a great job of pointing out a, a couple tactics or traits that we might, want, might look for in future responders or future analysts. And I think um, more so than what degree you have, having a curious mind, um, combined with some of that skepticism is really a key skill that we have on the team of saying, you know, hey, um, okay, I see that this is what this, the data is showing me right now, but something doesn't quite add up, so I'm gonna really dig deep into that and make sure. And then the third part, um, the calmness, like uh, that's such a critical skill, and uh, you know, you guys both highlighted that in terms of, hey, you know, we're getting the first call, oftentimes it's a chaotic situation, um, uh, my team members and I, we were just called into uh, one of these incidents on Friday night. In the initial uh, conversation, it was a major corporation, their CISO was on the line, and they had information that pointed to potentially one of our firewalls, and we're very concerned about traffic that was coming from there or that looked like it was coming from there. And uh, when we got on the phone, tensions were very high. Like, hey, we need answers on this immediately. And so it took, uh, you know, not only a lot of technical skills to be able to work through the situation and identify, hey, this actually wasn't the case, 
Um, but that calm manner in which we responded initially just started to like, you know, uh, tamper down the amount of chaos and frustration on the call and say, okay, like I, the, you know, the client very much saw that, okay, you guys are interested in getting answers as quickly as we are. You've got a lot of good data. We can work through this. But there very much is like this almost, uh, you know, the human uh, potential or the human element, I should say, uh, you know, of these conversations where you're a little bit like a therapist at times. Security therapy, I think yeah. our resumes. Yeah, I love that point on calm. And I think one thing I always go back to is like panic is not a necessary part of the incident response cycle. <laughs> There's a difference Great. between panicking and having a sense of urgency. And I think trying to yeah. have that calm urgency, ooh, that is a tough balance, but yeah, if you can achieve it, I think it's so much more productive than running around with your hair on fire. That feeling that your parents gave you when you were a kid, that, <laughs> that everything was going to be okay. You have to be able to exude that to the people who you're doing incident response for. And that's challenging. That's another skill that you learn over time. And I will yeah. tell you this, it's a real talk for people who are, again, new to this field. The first day of incident response for an investigator is scary. Mm -hmm. It is scary. You're never sure if you're going to find that initial piece of evidence you really need to, to catch the adversary. Once you start finding threads to pull on, then it becomes really engaging and interesting and you feel a lot better. But it's always a little scary the first day. But we have to work on our internal zen and being <laughs> calm about dealing with these intense crises that can have really serious consequences. Wow, well, yeah, the security therapy is really working. <laughs> you <laughs> feel calm very already. calm. I do. <laughs> um, I want to ask you in that vein, though, about incident fatigue, mm -hmm. uh, breach fatigue, burnout, because, uh, you know, that's something as you're all talking that I'm thinking about, you know, there's a difference between uh, a calm and, a, you know, an assurance and sort of being jaded or or, you know, uh, just being kind of tapped out, you know? And so uh, do you find uh, with yourselves or among your colleagues and, you know, uh, the camaraderie that you have on your teams that you all sort of talk about this or is it something everyone is kind of dealing with on their own? I think on healthy teams, you're talking about it. And I think that's awesome. Um, I manage a team of threat hunters and they have an on-call rotation. Right? And I was chatting with them recently, and someone pointed out, like, when you're on call and you get called, you know, multiple nights in a row, that's exhausting. I was like, you know what? I hear that. So amongst themselves, they decided, hey, instead of a five-day rotation, let's do a three-day rotation. I think having that healthy conversation of even between employee and manager, hey, I'm starting to feel really tired. Can we make some changes? Thinking about on-call rotations, how often you, you cycle people out, I think is, is a really, really healthy aspect of a team. Yeah, I think it's a real thing for sure. Um, it, you know, there's no doubt that that comes into play. And like you said, I think there are more conversations about it today than there have been in the past. Uh, you know, as a, as a leader, I'll look at like, if we've got a major incident where you've got a large team of people on it, you're not only looking at, okay, like how many days can the engagement manager stay on site without just totally, you know, losing it or needing to go back and see their family? Um, get some sleep, like just decompress for a few minutes. So trying to be strategic about how you might rotate, um, you know, people out in that regard, um, but also just realizing like um, that can have a play then in terms of the reaction to it. If the team is super burned out and tired, it's like, okay, I I'm just not going to be at my best in terms of what the calm energy that I'm going to bring to the client. So how do we, uh, you know, make sure that we're just keeping track of each other and making sure like, hey, have you guys spent enough time with your family or just away from work? Um, who needs the weekend off versus who's like really ready to go? Um, on the flip side of that though, I think one of the coolest things about our job is that um, just the mission impact, right? I don't have to talk to team members at any level of our teams about like why we're doing this or why it's important. These are people that wake up that are super excited about whether it's national security, whether it's protecting against cyber criminals. Um, you know, they really feel like, hey, we're, we're making um, a, a difference in the work that we do. And I don't think everyone has the luxury of saying that. So I think that is something that we're really fortunate for. I don't know if I'm allowed to do this, but I'm gonna ask the audience to raise your hand if you are responsible for maintaining an incident response plan for an organization, for updating it, creating it. 
Okay, so I'm gonna give you all some homework. Go in your incident response plan and make sure that the things that Wendy and that Katie just talked about in terms of rotations mm -hmm. during an incident are in your plan. I see them missing all the time in people's incident response plans. Incidents are high stress. Sometimes they go on for weeks, especially if they're, you're doing internal incident response for your organization. You need to have a plan for how you hand those off. What if somebody gets sick? What if the person you really rely on in your document is too unwell to keep going? You need to plan for all of those situations like rotation and handoff and the health and well-being of your responders during a long-term incident, and that needs to be in your plan. That's great homework, actually. Yeah. And a lot of people raise their hand, which really speaks to, you know, how many people, you know, in the audience and here in this community are, you know, shouldering this burden and kind of having this, you know, constant vigilance. I'm also wondering about these handoffs uh, within your teams and how you kind of coordinate all of this, given that more incidents are coming down the, you know, pike all the time. Um, and do you feel like you have the ability to uh, do that step back and kind of not, not just do the post-mortem, but have some uh, distance and then revisit incidents and see what you can learn with you know, that time away and perspective? Or does it feel like there's just always this grind where it's difficult to uh, you know, have the luxury of, of that reflection? I wish we had time to do <laughs> deep after actions for every incident. Um, I think it is so tough because there's always something new coming in. Um, but what I found is that when you don't take the time to reflect to do that after action, you find you make the same mistakes incident after incident after incident. Um, and so I would say if you have the luxury, if it's even a half day, an hour, a half hour, something after a major incident, pause, breathe, take a quick uh, moment to have an after action discussion with the team. What went well? What didn't go so well? What can we do better next time? And then the real challenge is following up on those items, right? Oh, we didn't have this log visibility. Let's improve that. Six months later, you find you actually don't have the same thing still. So it's not easy, but I think that, again, it's if you don't take that time, you're going to waste more time later because you're making the same mistakes. Yeah, I think. Uh so the, the way we try to organize it is you have a team of people that are responding to breaches. They may be, may be going on site. Some of them may be staying back. But then we have a team similar to Katie's where you have analysts who are really looking at the situation more strategically. So not having a lens into only this one breach, but looking across the board of all the work that not only the investigations we've done, but a lot of the other telemetry sources we're tracking. And then the goal with that team is that they're really able to start seeing patterns at a larger scale and say, hey, wait a minute, okay, this looks like it could be tied to this, and or maybe something uh, that we investigated four months ago, and now we see something else, now we actually think these are related. Um, so having you know, an organization where you've got some overlapping capabilities like that is really helpful. Um, but you know, that said, like the after action reports uh, post-incident, those are so critical, and I think that's something that we could probably all get better at um, because you then do get like mired into the next situation, um, and oftentimes like that next situation might be more exciting because you know, hey, it's new data sets now, new information, and we want to go jump on uh, you know in this case or investigation. One quick example um, on why that's so important: documenting what happened in an incident. Um, we've seen in most ransomware intrusions now there's some kind of exfiltration of data. And now there are intrusions that are just extortion, right? They steal the data, they say, pay us, or we're going to post it on the dark web. But one of the challenges we've seen actually recently with a couple customers is that adversaries will email them and say, hey, we are whatever ransomware group. Here's some data that we've stolen from you, right? Pay us, or we're going to post it to the dark web. That data if you don't know where that might have come from, if you haven't captured from a previous intrusion, maybe previous extortion or ransomware you had a year ago, if you don't know if that data was stolen, you don't know for this new incident whether it's old data or new data. I see this really commonly with those extortion intrusions where people don't take the time to actually think about what was stolen, what exact files, at what times. Then in the future, adversaries often try to re-extort so that's an example of why it's so important to kind of dot those I's, cross those T's. Those details really matter, including for future incidents. 
if you work for a security company like we do, you probably may have the luxury of having an intelligence team that's doing those types of reviews of big campaigns to understand how things are working in the broader cybersecurity and attack space. If you work for an organization doing cybersecurity for itself, you are the one who's going to have to answer the questions that Katie just talked about. Is there a persistent adversary who's continually attacking you? Is one intrusion related to the previous intrusion? You're going to have to answer those questions. We don't see the full picture necessarily as providers, as consultants over time in your organization, but you do. So you don't necessarily have that luxury of the big intelligence team that sees tons of attacks against a ton of different organizations. You should be getting that intelligence from somewhere. But you need to look at the intrusions that are happening in your environment long term to see if they're related. Yeah, I think all of this, you know, kind of helps me at least get a sort of deeper picture of, you know, both. I, I think that distinction you're drawing is really helpful, both, you know, both on the security firm side and, you know, uh, firms that are resourced enough to have that dual insight versus uh, companies that are trying to do it all for themselves. It, you know, I think it's important to really highlight that and talk about that. One thing that I really wanted to ask all of you going uh, into some, you know, some more of the threats everyone is facing right now uh, is I, I'm curious about what stands out in your mind or is important to you as something that the community either isn't talking enough about enough or, uh, you know, is talking about but d doesn't realize that there's a bit of an iceberg that, you know, we're talking about something but it's even bigger below the surface because uh, victims really don't want to talk about that thing. It, it could be a type of incident or it could be, you know, a, a technique or, you know, something that they feel is really embarrassing. Uh, to have happened to them. I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, what, what's the dirty laundry kind of? A lot of intrusions are coming from very simple places. The fundamentals are really, really hard, everyone. Asset inventories, knowing what computers you have, knowing your perimeter, knowing if you have exposed hosts, knowing that your network is properly segmented or not. Those are really challenging things to do, especially if you have a big network and Adversaries, for, mo for the most part, they're taking the path of least resistance. Yeah. They will choose easy targets, ones that they'll be efficient and effective at compromising. And so many incidents that we respond to, even in the critical infrastructure space, are still coming from simple mistakes in security hygiene. And of course, people don't want to talk about that. They want to talk about whiz bang cool things they saw at RSA. <laughs> yeah, that's neat. That's fun, right? But we do need to make sure that we've updated our network maps in the last 10 years, mm -hmm. please. <laughs> yeah, So I much a... homework from Leslie. Oh, it's I'm good, monster. it's good it's stuff. Good, good homework. I'm a monster, I'm sorry, <gasps> Katie. I love it. Yeah, I have a similar answer. Um, the thing that springs to my mind is cloud misconfigurations. Um, I think we are all embracing cloud as a great cheap way to store data, but it is, I, I think, sometimes easier to misconfigure a cloud environment than configure it properly. And you know, thinking about the basics, it's so important to configure it properly, set right, a password, and have a second factor of authentication. So many environments are just left wide open, right? Ports just open to the internet, no password at all, or a weak password that can be easily guessed. And you know, I think of that for Lily's question because it's embarrassing. If you, you know, set a default password password on your S3 bucket, an adversary just guesses that, logs in, steals a whole bunch of sensitive data, that's embarrassing, right? Even organizations have spent you know, millions of dollars on security tools, the best in the industry, if you don't configure your cloud environment correctly, data can walk out the door. So I think that's one that I'm hoping we'll start to see a little more reporting on what's going on in cloud environments, because I think that's a huge risk that maybe we're underestimating right now. I could not agree with both of you more. Uh, 100%. I think one other area I might add to that is that I do think there are still more ransoms being paid than are widely communicated. And we obviously all understand why you wouldn't go out, you know, shouting about that. Um, but I do hear it, you know, discussed more in kind of the dark rooms between CISOs, uh, you know, in trusted environments. And so I think just the awareness 
um, that that's still going on, and being able to ask your peers about, hey, you know, what's your plan for this? Like, have you spoken to your CEO? Do, is there, um, you know, what are the scenarios in which we would actually consider doing this? Doing that proactively, um, if that's the case, having a relationship with the CFO who's likely going to be responsible um, for potentially assisting in that transaction and making sure that occurs, do we have a way to potentially pay um, some sort of cryptocurrency? Uh, or is our policy that we're never going to consider that uh, absent any of these scenarios? So I think having those, like being aware that um, you all should be having those conversations. I think many organizations are, but just us talking a little bit more openly about it so that we can learn from one another, I think is helpful. Talking a little bit more about uh, communication, you know, as an incident is unfolding and, uh, you know, after the fact, both publicly particularly, but also internally, you know, within an organization. Um, how, what would you say about, you know, we often hear that, well, we, we can't really talk about something or get into specifics because, you know, we don't want to uh, give attackers, you know, an upper hand or give anyone an edge. Um, when is that really true and where it's really, uh, you know, valuable to uh, wait on sharing information and, you know, when would we want to encourage more transparency? It depends. There's my <laughs> Intel answer. It's been how many minutes before that? Um, Very diplomatic. I know, I know. <laughs> I mean, I think 3CX is a great, great example. I think that, right, CrowdStrike could have chosen to not say anything and kept that private, but in revealing that, I think they actually probably shut down that operation pretty quickly. Um, so I think there's so many considerations, right? Intelligence gained and lost. If we reveal this information publicly or in a private community, how would that change the way the adversaries behave? And I think that if there is an active intrusion, no, you don't want to publish, hey, we know how you're moving laterally to the internet. But there's a balance there, all right? I think that sometimes organizations don't want to accept any risk, but I think what we found is, even if it's privately in, in trusted sharing communities, that sometimes giving other folks a heads up on what's happening, not the victim details, not the in environment, not what user clicked the phishing email, but information about the threat actor, the TTPs, that's what others care about. Um, I would encourage this community to kind of lean forward a little bit. What can you share, even if it's private, Right? There are good reasons not to share publicly, but I think we see again and again that something that's targeting you is probably hitting other organizations. So it sounds cheesy, but sharing is caring in my opinion. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think there's a couple elements. So Katie's hitting a lot on the, you know, what can we be sharing to protect each other? I 100% agree with that. I think though that there also, uh, you know, can come into play the idea of what are organizations sharing publicly to like during a breach. And that's an area where organizations like are so graded on that, more so in public sentiment and public opinion than necessarily their response. So we've seen some great examples of organizations who've been transparent about it uh, and have actually gathered even more, you know, positive client sentiment and following because people feel like they've been transparent. There's cases though, unfortunately, where that's come back to bite other organizations because of regulations or other types of potential legal uh, work streams down the road. So I think that's still such a tricky question to answer, right? It, it's, as Katie said, it absolutely depends on the situation, but the more we can encourage the sharing to protect the greater good, that's absolutely the better. Get involved in your ISAC if you have one in your industry vertical. Mm -hmm. That is a private sharing group for organizations in a similar vertical to you and they exist by the grace of you participating in them and <laughs> maintaining them and making them healthy. Some of them are in much better conditions than others because they are a community effort. So get involved in the one that is applicable to your organization or business and try to keep it healthy and running because that's a good way to potentially, and when you can share depends, of course, but that's a potential way that you could share some critical information to perhaps similar organizations to you who might be targeted by the same adversaries and campaigns. And maybe on this point we can talk a little more about uh, public-private collaboration, uh, global incident response, uh, and we had all talked about this a bit in terms of ransomware, so you know, we could speak to that, but 
uh, any part of it that you uh, that stands out to you? You know, what do you think is going well? Do you think there's improvement on this type of collaboration and sharing? Uh, and you know, do we need to be leaning forward more, like Katie was saying? You know, even more, or uh, where do you think that's at? I think it's definitely on a really positive trajectory. Uh, you know, I have an opportunity to be on, not in the government side, right, but be partnered with a lot of government agencies, international law enforcement and intelligence agencies. And I think a couple things, um, one in the wake of Solar Winds, then certainly with Log4j, I do believe that between public and private partnerships, that started stemming a lot more real-time sharing. Uh, you know, with Log4j, you saw CISA leveraging GitHub and Twitter and Slack to share information pretty rapidly and leveraging existing technologies that are widely in use by organizations throughout the world, that was a big shift. Um, now I think with Russia, Ukraine, you not only see that continued public-private partnerships, but from my lens, and Katie, I'd definitely be interested in your perspective, because I know you're at the intersection, right, of a lot of these intelligence crossroads, but I see more sharing between us and our tr traditional competitors than I've ever seen before, and pretty rapidly, um, you know, people giving us a phone call, hey, that we just saw this indicator, uh, you know, where, where you guys are working with this other team. Can you look into this? Um, I'm seeing a lot more of that than I ever have in the last 20 years. So uh, I'm really excited and optimistic with that. I think so. I think, you know, theme of this year, stronger together. I think one of the wonderful things that I see is analysts, researchers, even if, you know, Palo Alto and Red Canary are competitors, like, I don't care, I'm gonna share threat information with Wendy and her team because it makes us all better. Um, I think the public-private thing is, is tricky, and it's interesting because um, I think it's interesting, Cyber UK was last week, and it's interesting to compare and contrast different countries' approaches. Um, I think that in the US, right, realistically, the US government has had a tough time with private sector, and I think so often in cyber policy circles, right, information sharing, it's kind of the like thoughts and prayers of cyber policy, because what's What's the solution? We do need more information sharing. And I think there have been so many efforts and like the intentions are great. Um, what I found with information sharing, it comes down to personal relationships, um, which is challenging because that's not always scalable, right? Public, private, you know, maybe officially government can't share anything, but there are amazing FBI agents, even folks from Cybercom, from NSA even, who will share with researchers at private companies. Yeah, we gotta raise the roof for one of those agencies in the audience, but I think that the real challenge is building on the personal relationships that work so well in information sharing. How do you institutionalize that? I don't think it's a solved problem. I think there are a lot of people working on it. I think <coughs> JCDC from CISA has promise. I think looking to uh, things that work really well, like NCSC out of the UK has a great relationship with private sector. Um, but I, I'd also say for any government folks, and I used to work in government, push forward. I know, for example, NSA is Cybersecurity Collaboration Center, right? Trying to push an organization that has been super secret squirrel to share more. What can you declassify? So I think the more people who start working in private sector with private sector and government can start to push the U.S. government to maybe do more. And you, in critical infrastructure, this is huge. Bureaucracy is hard. <laughs> and one of the interesting topics to me, and Wendy and I were both in the Air Force, and you work for the government, Government bureaucracy and military bureaucracy can be very challenging to move fast and break things in. And there's a lot of potential in the reserve guard space, too, for helping with incidents and intelligence sharing, things like that. But that's a very slow-moving machine. Some states are doing interesting things with their national guards in terms of helping with incident response. Others have done nothing. So getting the engine to spin up and move has been challenging. But I also see positive direction in the critical infrastructure space. We see critical infrastructure utilities getting help from more government organizations, which is so desperately needed, especially from municipal utilities like water and sewage that have next to no resources. One other question I want to ask, because uh, I, I know we were all talking about this, that it's an, maybe a little bit of an under-discussed area, is um, when we're thinking about bringing in the next generation of incident responders and you know, threat intel analysts, um, how, what do we need in that next generation and you know, how are you all approaching uh, you know, providing support and mentorship and sort of bringing the right people in? It's all you. Oh, geez. I know this is a big Leslie. I, you're passionate about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
You know, all of us started a while ago. I, I'm not going to guess how long ago all of <laughs> us years. started. <laughs> Two years, yes. Yeah. We're all 20. Uh, <laughs> Love that. Yep. Definitely. We didn't have a great support structure when we got into this field. And so I personally feel like I need to overcompensate for the next generation. So I do a lot of mentorship. I run an online conference to teach young people how to get into cybersecurity. We're all doing a lot of stuff. Katie's teaching. We're doing a ton of different things to build pipelines and bring people in. Because in, from my perspective, nobody helped us. And we desperately need good people. We need people who don't necessarily look like us. We need people from all over the world being a part of this effort because we have so many problems to solve. Katie? Yeah, plus one to everything. I would just encourage people to uh, think about bringing in junior employees not as a risk, but as an opportunity. Um, I think it's tough because you bring someone in, you train them up, and then they go elsewhere. And that can be tough, but I think we need more of that. And just recognition, that's OK, because we made our industry stronger. Um, so I would encourage everyone, try to reach out to someone, again, maybe who looks a little bit different. Is there someone you could bring along, right? Because we all started somewhere, and like, who can we uh, keep the door open for behind us? Um, absolutely agree. I think I would add to it, too. We need a bigger pipeline of the best and brightest students and best and brightest minds out there. And a challenge that I see, especially at uh, high school levels, but even before that, junior high, grade school, is that there are a lot of great students out there that just simply don't even know that cybersecurity exists and what it is as a career field. Um, my own nieces didn't know what it was because you know high schools oftentimes don't have computer security, I mean, just computer science programs to begin with, but then cybersecurity teams. And so the more we can um, increase awareness, have competitive opportunities, so like teams that um, these younger children can compete on to be aware of, and just really raise awareness at that level, I think the more we can do to better the future for us. Love it. So we have time to take one or maybe two questions. I think there are some mics around. And to this point about bringing people in, we just thought it would be nice. But just uh, make sure we can hear the question mark at the end of your question. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yes. Mm. Nobody has any questions about incident response. You all have it down. From there. You can walk oh. up to the mic. Yeah, the, the microphones yeah. are stationed strategically around this room. Lovely. We've got a few. Should we start over the here? The emergency exits think? are too. <laughs> hey, so, so my question is, how much is too much sharing? Because this is a problem that I have, right? Right? When we have an incident, it's really scary to share that we had an incident. So how much is too much sharing? That's it. I, yeah, I'm going to take Katie's default answer of it depends, <laughs> right? So it depends who the sharing is with and what the situation is. Uh, we were talking about this backstage. Like, there's a certain amount of sharing sometimes even within an organization that needs to occur of limiting that uh, in terms of, you know, maybe not every employee needs to know. Maybe people outside the security team, uh, you know, who aren't responding, like, there may be legal reasons that you need to confine that. Um, I think the bigger challenge is, um, so I'll pick one element out of that, and you guys can pick more, I think, um, but would be like the sharing in what time frame, um, specific to like the first 24 to 48 to 72 hours of an incident, one of the biggest challenges I see is organizations who share too much too soon, and then the information changes because evidence is dynamic, we don't have all the data yet. Um, so one thing we encourage organizations to do is be very careful about not sharing information that will need to be walked back at some point. I think going back to that, what is your assessment? What's your evidence? That's kind of a key way you can do that. We assess. It's early. I'm th I think one thing that's always going to be too much is calling out specific victims, right? We work for vendors. Never call out this specific company was breached, right? The specific person who clicked the phishing email. I think that's always going to be too much in my opinion. Um, protecting that information. Um, but other than that, yeah, it depends. I always recommend starting smaller with a trust community and ISAC or peers, and then expanding, um, because I think that can mitigate some of the risk a little bit, starting with a smaller sharing sharing group. Uh, good, good morning. Uh, I do have a question. You were talking about uh, being skeptical during the first 24 hours. 
but uh, with uh, the raising of those ransomers, do you really think that waiting 24 hours being skeptical is good for your customers? Yes, yeah, so the question being, is it really good to be skeptical for 24 hours, right? Is that good for customers? I think, you know, what I would say is being skeptical doesn't mean you're not doing anything, right? You know, if you think there might be ransomware, you're going to hunt for lateral movement. You're going to look how they got in. You're going to do all of those things. It's just more of a mindset of if someone comes out with a blog post or a tweet saying, oh my gosh, it's Russia, you're like, um, let's stay focused on scoping the incident. Let's not trust every random open source thing. So I think you can be skeptical, but still take action, if that makes sense. From a scientific method perspective, when you're doing good science, you're always trying to disprove your hypothesis. That's what we're doing in incident response to. We're still doing science. We're still doing an investigation. We're still looking for evidence. We're still trying to corroborate it. But we're trying to disprove our hypotheses instead of prove them, because that could be there could be confirmation bias there. I think one thing, too, just specific to ransomware, um, it works in an organization's favor to buy more time. So especially those first 24, 48, 72 hours, um, the more information that you can glean from the potential attacker, the engagement with them to be able to buy your organization time to then make a decision based on what data that unfolds over that time, significantly better off you will be in terms of lessening the operational impact. Um, if you do decide that, hey, potentially paying a ransom is the option we have here, you then use that time to negotiate that as well. So, um, you know, attackers tend to always use time as a pressure valve on victims, and that's something that uh, organizations can use very effectively against them. Thank you. One other question that I would ask uh, is, because we didn't quite get to this, is, um, in that vein, you know, how do you all approach or sort of what are some of the differences uh, dealing with incidents that are criminal in nature versus government-backed actors? And, you know, the first 24 hours or the first, you know, the, this sort of timeline that we've talked about, uh, what are the differences there as you're trying to sort out either what is going on or who is the actor or, you know, if you have a sense, trying to start that process? Ooh, I'm not sure I'm going to agree with my peers on this one, but I'll, I'll give my, my opinion here. We love here. it. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Throw some chairs. First of all, I, I'm cautious about any attribution to countries. You, that's a dangerous thing to do unless you have boots on the ground intelligence. There's false flag operations. There's confusion about subcontractors and criminal organizations that are involved with countries. So you attribute criminal actors and state-based actors in similar ways. You look at what they can do, what their capabilities are, how they operate. So in some ways, you do things very much the same for both of them. You're responding in the same way. And also, that's because their capabilities are starting to become fairly equivalent in a lot of reasons. Uh, there's more resources available to criminal actors. They've made a ton of money on things like ransomware and BEC. And they can do things that were traditionally reserved capabilities for state adversary groups before. Yeah, I'll just say attribution can matter, but it, when you're starting a response, I don't think focusing on what country it is is the best approach. Thinking about can we identify the malware, the patterns, how they might be moving laterally, I think that's much more important than the country, although that sometimes matters too later on. Yeah, completely agree. I think um, that the onset of investigation same approach, right? But towards the, uh, where it could change would be the outcome or what are the next steps are. Uh, you know, if you've got data that you need to relay potentially to an intelligence organization, if it's national security related, there may be some different handling and steps there. But um, initially approaching every investigation, right, in a very similar manner. I think we had someone over there who's been patiently waiting oh, for a question. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Hi. Uh, hi, I'm going to roll it back to uh, the uh, earlier question about that uh, whole 24 to 78 hour window and when do you start sharing and when do you let anybody know. And it was kind of, it's interesting, like, like um, the, the take that I'm getting for you guys is kind of keep some things close to the vest until you're really, really sure. But um, on Monday, I went to this uh, modern bank heist panel where uh, the U.S. Secret Service's uh, Matt O'Neill said um, that's the crucial time to reach out to uh, Secret Service or FBI or anybody because it's like the huge cash out transaction, transaction fraud. It's like it, the first 24 hours, if they can stop it then, they can claw back 
most of the money or much more of it than if they wait. And the longer you wait, the more money an organization is going to lose. So could you kind of discuss like that, that friction between keeping it close to the vest and letting law enforcement know as soon as possible for, to limit financial pain? Well, I'll add some homework. That should be in your incident response plan, right? <laughs> of course, go back, update that. Think about establishing those, those relationships early so you can have a Secret Service agent, FBI agent, where you say, hey, we saw this thing today. We think, right, if there's a weird wallet address, this might be unusual. We're not totally sure yet, but I want to give you an early heads up. I think it's all about establishing that trust before the incident and then being able to say with a level of confidence, we're not totally sure, but here's an early tip so they can take action. And it sounds to me like he was referring to a very specific type of transaction and case, right, financially motivated, uh, maybe wire fraud, BEC related. And those cases, yes, they're talking specifically about like the measures that the US government and working in coordination with other governments abroad can leverage to claw that money back. Um, so that's absolutely critical in those cases, but Katie's point is super valid. Like, have the relationships in advance, be able to have a cell phone number of someone that's gonna answer your call on the other end, and be able to say, oh, hey, yeah, this is something we do need to get involved in, or maybe not the case. Right. Well, I feel like we all got a lot of fascinating insights from the three of you, and a lot of good homework, so everyone get on it. <laughs> Thank you all for your time. Thank, Thank you. you.